Hello, BookTube. The other day, Michael K. Vaughn did a video on his channel. I'll leave a link to it down below. It was fascinating. It was 12 classics that you simply must read. <laughs> and he picked idiosyncratically, as you would expect. Uh, and it was fascinating, you know, if you are another, uh, a fellow canonical reader, someone who's gotten a lot of non schoolroom, genuine personal thrill and pleasure out of reading canonical books. He has. And uh, as you know, if you've watched this channel, so have I. And it was the kind of video where if you ha are that kind of reader, you watch it and you immediately want to make a response of your own, a rejoinder, not criticizing his choices, uh, but adding choices of your own. <laughs> and so uh, that's what I want to do today. Uh, I want to do uh, 12 more classics that you simply must read. <laughs> and like Michael's video, I will uh, ground a few of these things in the ancient world. Uh, which has a somewhat unfair reputation as the most unapproachable classics of them all. Uh, there's a language barrier, there's a time barrier, there's also a huge cultural bar barrier. Most people know that in addition to being distant from you by 2,000 years and by a dead language, Virgil is also distant from you and in having inspired 30% of the rest of the literary canon that comes after him. That starts to be a real weight. That was one of the reasons why I did my, uh, my Western canon starter kit years ago was to to break that up to, to dust that off these books which were after all meant to be read they were meant to be enjoyed and uh, I acknowledge that 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 weight is there I acknowledge that intimidation factor is there for people who are coming to these things cold but nevertheless uh, there are ancient masterpieces and then there are ancient works of literature there are ancient works of literature that are more inviting than others uh, for someone who doesn't know the language and who doesn't know the history. And I wanted to recommend a couple of those just because I think it's been my experience when introducing these things to people uh, that if you can get someone to read a classic of ancient Greece or Rome that they really enjoy, just plain enjoy. No notes, no dissertation, no comparative literature, no nothing like that. They just enjoyed reading it. They're more likely to go after something else in the ancient world. Uh, so I want to recommend two works from ancient Greece and Rome that are well worth reading. You will enjoy them in addition to, you know, having the, the cred of reading an ancient work. And the first one is something we've seen on this channel many, many times before. This is Suetonius. This is the Twelve Caesars. Uh, this is a collection of short biographies that he did of, of the first 12 men to rule the Roman Empire, starting with Julius Caesar and going all the way to the year of the four emperors with full with with lives full of anecdotes and spicy bits suetonius was very much writing this to be read by normal people and it was read by normal people it was gobbled up by them uh this is i just picked this because i like the cover this is translated by alexander thompson the translation that you are most likely to come across is the one by robert graves the novelist the poet the author of i claudius and it is quite good it's the one of the reasons why it's been kept in service all this time is not just the recognition factor of Graves' name, uh, since that's largely gone nowadays, but also that it's a very, very strong translation. It works really well. For Suetonius, you are probably going to need a version that has footnotes or endnotes uh, in order to explain some of the little digressions that Suetonius makes that you won't understand otherwise, but you will definitely get the drama. You will definitely be interested in these, in biographies of ancient Roman emperors, believe it or not. And the next one, the same thing, the next one is the archetypal adventure story. This is by uh, Apollonius of Rhodes, and it is uh, Jason and the Argonauts, the Argonautica. Uh, and this is the story of a young man assembling a superhero team, essentially. He's put on an, on an undoable quest, an impossible quest, and he assembles an amazing crew to go on that quest, uh, including Hercules. But lots of other people, too. People who can fly, people who can see through solid objects. Uh, Orpheus, whose music can animate inanimate objects, and also calm, very animate objects. Who can His music can master the supernatural world that the Greeks lived in. And many other interesting figures, too, and there's a lot more in this book. It also has a tangential connection with Robert Graves, as all books do, ultimately down the line. Talk about six degrees of separation. Uh, because Robert Graves wrote a serviceable book called Hercules, My Shipmate. Uh, which was his kind of retelling of the, the Jason story. But there is no reason. I mean, it, Hercules, my shipmate, is a little bit wordy at times. It's a little bit turgid. But it is good. It is an enjoyable book. But there's no reason to read it as a substitute for reading Apollonius. He himself is incredibly readable. 
So just find a Penguin Classic or you know an old Mentor Classic, something with a serviceable introduction, or read the introduction on Wikipedia, and then dive into the adventure. You will enjoy it. Uh, and neither neither uh, the Argonaut, neither the voyage of Jason and the Argo, nor the Twelve Caesars is particularly long. Uh, they're not a burden on your reading time. They're not going to suck you down. Uh, like some of the books on Michael K. Vaughn's list did. <laughs> he, he lists a couple of mega chunkers. And he does it because his heart's in the right place, because he was, he was letting his own enthusiasm make his list, as l such lists should be made. Uh, and that is the most that I can do to excuse the fact that there are a couple of chunkers on my own list. <laughs> and one of them... <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of them is The Tale of Genji uh, by Murasaki Shikibu. Uh, this is the first and still the best novel of them all. It's quite huge. If you get... An, this is the, uh, the Royal Tire translation. There's also been one by Edward Seidensticker and also Dennis Washburn and uh, David Washburn. They are... They do unabridged Genjis. An abridged Genji would be an abomination. And unabridged, it's a long thing. Uh, and it's also unconventional in terms of Western novel telling. It's an undertaking, in other words. If you are a Western reader, this, this is a story of court life a thousand years ago and of one particular denizen of that court life. But you're not. if you've read only Western literature... You're not going to be reading this long before you realize that it is talking in a vocabulary that you don't understand. Not, not to do with English language translation. The Royal Tyler translation is very good. And this cover is actually the Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition of, they do, of, of, what, of the Royal Tyler translation. And is one of the prettiest volumes of Genji that you can go out on the market and buy. Just a lovely thing. But it's not a question of translation. It's a question of a different world, which no translator can fix. This novel is told with different priorities in mind along different storytelling traditions than Western traditions. It's still accessible. It's still enjoyable. I know plenty of people who have not, I have, I have read this thing many, many times in many, in all of the English language translations, uh, never read it in the original. What a thrill that must be. Uh, but I know plenty of people who aren't that familiar with this book, who did eventually pull it down off their shelf and read it and enjoyed it. That's because it's enjoyable. <laughs> it's very good. It's very smart. It's very whimsically observant. The, the author is, is sort of floating above all of the action, commenting wryly, but also affectionately on everybody in her story and her, her gigantic cast. And it's shot through with lovely imagery and lovely poetry. So uh, it's huge. It's a big undertaking. It's, it's five times longer than Suetonius and Apollonius put together. But it had to be on my list. <laughs> uh, then this next one can be, can be a bit long if you have a complete volume. But it's nowhere near as long as it would have been if it had been finished. This is The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, which is a, a collection of the stories told by pilgrims on the road on a pilgrimage uh, in the spring. <laughs> and they, are, they each tell stories, not necessarily autobiographical stories, although the interstitial narration of the stories tells us a lot about them, a lot about the tellers. And the, the story, some of them may be familiar to you. They've been bothered and adapted many, many times. But the thing about this book that makes it a joy, that puts it on this list, is that the people in the Canterbury Tales are immediately alive. Not just the people in the stories, but the people telling the stories. They are immediately alive. They have the trappings of, you know, a thousand years ago, of Chaucer's day. But you know these people. And by a certain extent, with a slight, a slight twist of your imagination, you know the people who are in their stories as well. As a result, there's almost no book like this. One of the only books like this that I know of that would belong on, for instance, a 12 classics you must read list would be the poems of the Roman poet Horace. And that will not be on my list because that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to, to appreciate Horace. He's, he's not as accessible in any way as Suetonius, for instance. Uh, in terms of that immediate recognizable humanity, that feeling of like it or like these people or don't like them, you know them and you want to keep reading about them, you will go back to the Canterbury Tales many times. Uh, this is the Penguin Classic cover. I believe that Penguin Classic still prints the Neville Coghill version of the Canterbury Tales, which is English. It's put into modern English. Chaucer wrote in a pre-modern English. 
It's a recognizable English. I, it's readable. Penguin makes a big, fat volume of the Canterbury Tales that is not English. It is not modernized. It is in the language that Chaucer wrote. And that language is not impossible for you to read. Unlike, for instance, uh, Beowulf in the oldest English. Chaucer, it doesn't take much for you, to, for you to learn how to read him in his own language without anyone interpolating those lines, without anyone like Peter Ackroyd or, or Neville Coghill updating his English. And that's a good thing because Chaucer was incredibly adroit at using his own language. And a lot of the fine sensibility there, including some really good puns, some really good jokes, some really elegant wording, isn't really possible to bring into modern English. Some of the words have simply fallen out of usage. The only way you're going to get that, the only way you're going to get the full genius of, jo of Chaucer is to read him without those interpolators neatening up the rhythm and punching it up from modern English. So that would be my advice. But if you, if that, I, the last thing I want is for this list to intimidate. So if that intimidates you, the idea of, it's not you learning a new language. It's mostly, it'll be mostly recognizable to you. But if that intimidates you, then read Neville Coghill or some other modern, Peter Ackroyd did a modernization of these just to get the sense of it. Just to get the sense, that, that will be enough for you to get the sense of it. And once you do get the sense of it, once you're familiar with the major tales and the prologue and whatnot, you'll probably want to go and give it a try. Give reading Chaucer's original a try. It's not as hard as it looks, believe me. Uh, then we'll go, uh, another translated work, another classic. This is The Prince by Machiavelli. Also a short work, but more seminal than almost anything else on this list in terms of uh, modern political states. This, this is Machiavelli's little handbook for how a prince should govern and how a prince shouldn't govern what things a prince should see clearly, and what things a prince should consider disposable. Uh, and it was written... It was written in a, a foretaste of not only the Italian Renaissance, but also the idea of non-clerical nation-states. Of nation-states that aren't religious bodies, or that aren't ruled directly by religious bodies. And you... If you know about this book, you have probably heard it quoted a million times. You've probably seen the adjective Machiavellian. But a lot of people who have experienced that kind of echoes of this book have never read the book. And you should. It's very good reading. Machiavelli, he's known for this one book, but he was a tremendously talented writer. Uh, and I think when you, if you read The Prince, the English language translation in the Penguin Classic or Oxford Classics, really any English translation will do fine for this book. Uh, when you read it, Finally, when you read it instead of hearing about it, I think you will find that certain central tenets of it have been largely misunderstood by a lot of people who refer to this book, especially politicians. Uh, so in terms of a book that has to be on your list, some of these things are duplicating stuff that was in my Western Canon starter kit, but it's Michael K. Vaughn's fault, and some of them won't duplicate that list. Uh, the next one uh, of a classic that you must read is a play. <laughs> it, is, it is Hamlet the greatest play, arguably, by the greatest playwright uh, in human history. Uh, I might argue that Lear, that King Lear, is a greater work of art, uh, but there's no way to uh, call yourself classically inclined or classically friendly without reading this. You have to know Hamlet backwards and forwards. You have to know the play. Uh, what happens in it, and uh, also as many essays as you care to read of people's reaction to it over the centuries. Uh, so this is <laughs> this is sort of the answer to uh, that cheesy old advertising line. If you read one Shakespeare this year, <laughs> let it be Hamlet. This would be my cheesy answer to that. If you are put off by Shakespeare, if for some reason he has never called to you, never, never really uh, invited you to read his work, probably because he was poorly taught to you when you were in school. Uh, that's a rant for another day. But if he's this author that that lives on your shelf but never on your nightstand, read Hamlet. Or, or, I mean, you read Hamlet and you will enjoy it. I guarantee that you will. The best possible way to encounter this, aside from going and seeing it in the theater, would be to do something I recommend all the time. I don't know. In the pre-COVID days, it was probably a lot more possible than it is now. And that is to get a group of friends together in the room, have a little wine uh, making its way around the room, assign people parts, and read the play in multiple voices. You don't have to act it. Nobody has to stand up and, 
can't do anything like that. But that is the way to get this, is if you're all grappling with what your, your characters are actually trying to say. That's when the, the veil of time, the veil of distance between you and Shakespeare just falls away. So that's the ideal way to experience this. But even reading it, we'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be fine. Uh, then this next one uh, didn't make it on Michael K. Vaughn's list, but it has to be on mine. This is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Uh, this is... Uh, it's slight. It's not long. It's, it's slight and predictable in terms of its plot. It has a three-tiered plot that is very easy to follow. It's romance-driven. And if you're reading Pride and Prejudice for the first time and you're thinking, boy, this, you know, this is kind of predictable, I want to stress, the reason it's predictable is because everyone after Pride and Prejudice ripped it off. It's not Jane Austen's fault. It's actually wonderful to read. One of the most infinitely rereadable books that I know of, uh, even though it, I believe, set the template for an entire genre. Romance authors can, can say all they want, that they've never got around to reading Jane Austen or that they think she's boring, but they are working in her garden. And Pride and Prejudice, I believe, started it all. I think, my own pet theory, is that if you chase down the various archetypes of romances, the the busybody matchmaker who finds love in the end, the the uh, second chance romance, the uh, the rough banter romance where the, the two are sparring partners before they fall in love. If you chase down every one of those little splinter subgenres of romance, I think they all come down to the collected works of Jane Austen. I think the urtext of every one of those separate things is in a different Jane Austen novel. But uh, there's no literary criticism about how you'll enjoy this book. Once you get into Jane Austen's uh, vocabulary, the rhythm of her banter, you'll fall in love. Uh, don't you listen to that hard Sean Stanfast when he says that it's a terrible book. He is, in this instance, just wrong. <laughs> uh, then we'll go with another, we'll go, we'll go up in page length here. We'll go with another big book. Uh, but it is seminal. One of the greatest novels ever written in the English language. And that is Middlemarch by George Eliot, uh, which is on the surface a very small story about small doings in a small town called Middlemarch. Uh, but it is engrossing. It is, it is everything that Jane Austen is not. It's not short, it's long. It doesn't sparkle and hide the sharp edges of its brilliance. Instead, it doesn't sparkle, it doesn't sparkle at all, and the sharp edges of its brilliance are everywhere. They're immediately obvious. Uh, it's, I have been reading this book and even once teaching it for a long time and I've never found the, quite the perfect way to recommend it, except to say, just enter its world, and I think you will see what I mean. Uh, there's a reason why so many readers, so many critics, so many other authors have ranked this as one of the best books they've ever read. There's a reason for that. That is not just bad PR. Uh, so I, I would strongly recommend it. It's also a bit of a doomed love story, uh, or bit of, there's a love story at the heart of it, a couple of them. Uh, and when we're talking about doom, <laughs> we're talking about uh, doom, that brings us on to our next book, which is The House of Mirth by Edith Ward, about a woman who is trying to climb in society. She is, she is a, she's kind of a permanent outsider, and she is trying to claw her way into the best set of society. And it's a merciless thing that she's doing, and that society is also merciless. And we follow her in what amounts to a slow course of beautifully written degradation. And it is it is brilliant. It is one of, again, like the, a lot of the other things on this list, is one of the greatest novels ever written in English. Uh, so it's it's on my list. Uh, then the next one uh, is a name that you would expect to be on my uh, 12 classics that you must read, but it's not a novel. I could have listed a couple of novels for this person, but I want I want to list uh, something else. Nonfiction. This is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. Uh, a slim thing, the transcription of a talk that she gave, about women and writing, about women in literature, uh, which sounds hackneyed, and it was a hackneyed request for a, a speech even when the request was originally made to her. She knows that. And she decides to, to expand on it in some ways that only Virginia Woolf could do. And the result is one of the greatest works of uh, nonfiction ever written. I could have listed some of Virginia Woolf's novels, but if 
where if I'm throwing the weight of must read behind this video, which of course is not true, it wasn't true in Michael K. Vaughn's video either. He he is as much a champion as I am of read what you like. There's no must here at all. But you get you get what it means in his video and definitely in mine is urgently recommend. I'm urgently recommending that you read these things. They are they are not just important. That would be nothing. That means nothing. You can read Mac Bowl and Executioner novels from now until you're 150, and I will applaud you the whole way. <laughs> it's not that. It's not any kind of obligation that goes with, that seems like it's implied by the word must. Instead, it's must in terms of this is incredible stuff. If you haven't read it, you're missing out on something, and The Room of One's Own is hair-raisingly brilliant, however short it is. Uh, then, uh, the next book, we'll go back to Penguin Classic. They do, they do an excellent edition of this, but it's not like we lack for editions of this. And this is also hair-raising. Uh, this is uh, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. This is the late, I think this is the latest Penguin Classic edition. It has a very good introduction, good notes, but this is a book that you don't need notes for. This is Frederick Douglass writing the story of his own life, his emancipation from slavery, and his rise to become a national figure in the abolition movement, a national figure of what this book does, I think, more silently than anything else, more uncomfortably than anything else, uh, is remind you of the wasteful cruelty of what the South referred to as their peculiar institution. Because you're reading this book and you're thinking, okay, but Frederick Douglass wasn't the only brilliant person. How many of them? They're stories we never even learned. They never were taught how to read. How many of them would have written books this powerful? And this is mighty powerful. <laughs> this is a mighty powerful book. And one of the books on this list, I won't say all of them, but this is one of the books on this list, obviously, for, re for obvious reasons, A Room of One's Own is another one. But this is a book that really benefits by being read out loud. Uh, to get the full rolling cadence of Douglas's prose style, which is just beautiful. Uh, so uh, that's another one that you that you must read. And then, believe it or not, we're at the end here. We'll finish up with uh, The Makioka Sisters uh, by Tanizaki, which is a, a big, uh, relatively modern, 20th century Japanese novel about a family that was well-to-do and is hitting hard times, specifically uh, the women in that family. And through that lens... Tanizaki manages to lay bare an entire society. Uh, it's, it's foibles, it's strengths, it's fun people, it's miserable people, it's demands. Uh, it's an amazing book. Uh, again, like with a lot of other books on this list, it takes a bit of time to acclimate yourself to the cadences of the author, but once you've done that, you will read it. You will reread it. It is a brilliant, brilliant novel. Uh, and there you go. <laughs> there you go. That is a list of... 12 more classics that you absolutely must read. <laughs> uh, and I use this, I'm, I'm offering this video as kind of an addendum uh, to Michael's. There were, there were a couple of choices on his list that, uh, that I don't love as much as he does. I'm sure there are a couple of choices on my list that he doesn't love as much as I do. But now that I've done a response, I want a response from some of the rest of you have loved reading canonical literature. Plenty of you don't, and that's just fine. I subscribe to your channels. I love your videos. Anyway, I don't care. I care about how you're reading, not what you're reading. I want to know how enthusiastic you are or how, how pee-offed you are at a book that you've just finished. I don't care that you're reading the quote-unquote right books. There are no quote-unquote right books. But if you are canonically inclined, if you read the classics for pleasure and you have in the past, feel free to make a response video of your own with 12 of your own classics. It's infinite food for thought. It's so much fun to see what would make your list. So feel free to do that. <laughs> In the meantime, I will I will wrap this up for now, and I'll remember to leave a link to Michael's video so you know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you.